Welcome to the Business Vitality Podcast. My name is Katherine Canty. I am the host and an executive coach. I work with teams, individuals, and leaders to help create measured leadership change. We do that using practical applications, and our clients are creating 100% measured results as seen by those around them. Not necessarily what I think or what they think, but what the other people are seeing. And they are being recognized for the hard work that they're doing. If you're interested in learning more about some of the work that we're doing, you can learn more at KatherineCanty.com. I would love for you to subscribe to this show, to Business Vitality. This is my way to continue to pay it forward and share business best practices. Stay tuned and listen to the interview. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the Business Vitality Podcast, uh, where we are celebrating leaders who are thinking differently. Business Vitality is all about the power to continue to exceed results in this ever-changing marketplace. Uh, Remaining vital in business today includes thinking outside this box. I'm your host, Catherine Canty. Today's guest is Justin Nazuri, and he is with Captivate, and I am so excited that you are here today. You have one of the most amazing backgrounds, and it is a treat um, to be able to kind of talk a little bit about your background. Do you mind if I share before we dig in? Yeah, please do, and I just appreciate the opportunity to, to meet with you today, so thank you for that too. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you blow me away. You are a nuclear submarine officer. Yep. And for that, I am extremely appreciative and thankful of your service and, and for keeping us safe and keeping us here um, on the American soil. So thank you so much. Um, I'm impressed by you receiving $3 million of funding from Eric Schmidt, um, Google's chairman for Storybox. So I know there's a wonderful story there. Yep. And uh, it looks like you are now celebrating uh, one year as a founder, again, uh, with a business called Captivate. And um, you are serving clients such as Disney, Microsoft, and IBM, and even more the, um, I think LinkedIn and your website has a very extensive list. So it is extremely impressive. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Um, Tell me with Captivate, can you tell me a little bit about Captivate? Um, There's some things in there that I find intriguing, but I would love to hear from you. Tell me about Captivate. Yeah. And when you talk about thinking differently, it's it's interesting through that lens because I feel like I'm grateful for the opportunity to start another company. And a lot of it has been thinking differently than when I started the first company, which we can certainly talk about. But for, for context for listeners, um, I started Captivate.ai a year ago. And it came out of an insight I had from two previous ventures. Uh, The first thing I learned with Storybox was that marketers have a really tough job because to stay relevant, to get in front of customers, most companies have to be posting daily on half a dozen different social networks. And the question that kind of came out of that experience with Storybox is, how on earth can you do that? How can you keep up with high quality content and do it day in, day out? Um, Along my journey, I also started a podcast called Beyond the Uniform. It's meant to help military veterans. And in 407 episodes, one of the things that I learned was, man, podcasts are such an incredibly efficient vehicle for content marketing. Because I found that I could... You know, I would never wanted to sit and write a blog post. I never wanted to even write a tweet. But if you put me in front of someone for an hour, just like you and I are doing right here, in an hour, I would say things that would surprise me. The guest would say things that were really helpful. And I thought, man, if we could just dissect this podcast, we could have five blog posts, 20 tweets, LinkedIn posts, YouTube videos, Instagram, TikTok. I mean, we could cover all of the bases effortlessly. And that's what we do at Captivate.ai. We turn a podcast into months of social media content. We use data to see what's working, why it's working, and it helps us get more efficient. I love that. I um, was sharing with you before we we started recording was, um, you know, inefficiencies drive me bonkers. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what are like some of these inefficiencies that you're seeing before these clients are working for you? What are some of their struggles that they're sharing with you? I I think a couple of things stand out to me that the first is, you know, it's actually great if they have inefficiencies, because a lot of companies 
aren't even doing anything. You know, you, you, the first thing I do when I'm meeting with someone is I, I do some social digging and I'm kind of surprised that a lot of companies don't have a great presence on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. Those are kind of table stakes for most, most organizations. Once you get to about 20 employees, you need to have a presence. So, so first of all, in, inefficiency is, is better than most because <laughs> at least you're doing something. <laughs> Um, I think that an inefficiency that I see is that um, once a company starts to have multiple employees, they're not really leveraging all of these people's networks. You know, they're, they're, when I look, I don't see that their team is publishing content. They're not doing it in a coordinated way. They're not doing it in a way that really tells the company's story and builds them up as credible experts, as thought leaders in their space. So that's certainly an inefficiency. Um, another inefficiency is they're not really learning. It just sometimes feels like they are shouting into a room and not really understanding what's working, why it's working, how it's working so they can improve on it. And, and marketing is something that can be learned from it can be it can be iterative but the number of companies that i see that are just throwing things out and not really understanding why certain things land and other things fall flat so those are the two biggest inefficiencies that i see i love it so if we dig into this some of the folks that i have talked with over the years um they're talking you know they have like a marketing person and they'll have their their company page but then they also have all of their employees that are posting kind of like what you're talking about they don't really have that process in place and i'm a very much process driven person yeah. um and definitely you know learn from the mistakes and let's measure and, and see where it's working where it's not working do you help not just the marketing department, but some of these employees create consistent messages that are going to be put out into social media or how does that work? Um, are you just working directly with marketing? It, it depends on the organization, but there's um, a, about maybe a third of our clients where I, I call it spoon feeding. And so let's just say, you know, obviously we, when we work with a company, we want to uniquely work with them in a way that's right for them. So it changes. But but one trend that I've seen is that um, most companies, their executives, their C-suite have a large following and oftentimes a large ego to go along with that. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. But most of them don't have time to be posting on social media. So for many of our clients, we will automatically email them two, three times a week Hey, uh, you know, whoever it is, here is your post for LinkedIn today. Here's the copy that you can copy and paste or tweak. Here's the first comment. Here's the second comment. And, and most of these executives prosecute email well. So they'll get the email. They'll take the 30 seconds to post on whatever channel matters for them. That's one example. You know, but just to kind of give an alternate viewpoint, some of our clients are driven more by Slack. And so we will have automated messages going out on Slack, doing a similar thing of just teeing them up to succeed. And so, you know, it depends again on the executive and on the company, but we're all about saying, how can we best support you to keep the consistency that's required to succeed? And last thing that I'll say on that is that, you know, we're not, we're not selling virality. Anyone that sells that is, is clearly deceiving you. What we are selling is the same thing that makes exercise and investing work. And that is consistency. Going to the gym day in and day out, putting money into your savings, your IRA day in, day out. It's not sexy. It's not glamorous. And 100% of the time it works. We're just making it a little bit easier to post with the consistency that's necessary to win. I love the consistency and I love how you tailor it to whatever the customer, the client really yeah. needs for you to do. And, you know, so many times we see companies that are selling solutions, but they're not tailoring it to what the, the struggles are for that particular client. And, you know, being able to respond to them, whether it's going to be Slack or whether email, and then, you know, these busy executives, they probably have assistance or VAs that they can lean on. And you've already yeah. built this solution for them to be able to delegate it out and uh, just continues to allow them to have consistency in the market, 
brand recognition, a consistent voice um, across the board. And, you know, it, it sounds like a, a, a wonderful solution for a lot of people who were struggling with how do you get started with it? So I love that. Um, part of uh, the business vitality process that I've talked about and just things that I've learned over the year years are the importance of having this consistent strategy and vision. And, you know, for you to be able to raise significant funding now for two different startups, can you tell me how the vision and the strategy played in with both of those? And has the vision and strategy changed and maybe some things that you've learned along the, the way? It's, it's so relevant because I'm at a point where I'm, I, 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 when I started Captivate, I didn't want to raise money and there's still part of me that doesn't want to, but more and more recently, I'm thinking, you know, I think we could actually benefit from it and I think we could actually do it. And so it's getting me in more of a headspace of how do I succinctly explain the business and, and for listeners who aren't interested in fundraising, it doesn't, you know, that's, that's been my journey with Captivate as well. It's been up until this point, more from a customer perspective of like, how do I, how do I be, how do I trim the fat on explaining what I do? And it, it's really a reminder to me of um, how much empathy I need in my life, because it it's, you know, the, the way that I explain Captivate does change based on who I'm speaking to. So, you know, um, for example, we're evaluating our technology and the value it serves to the, the industry of biotechnology, which I never would have thought of as a, a fit for us. But I'm just noticing as I'm t meeting with people and getting advice and learning about this industry, the way that I present what we're doing is different to that audience. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm starting to think about fundraising, it's the same fundamentals of who we are, but it's it's a different story of explaining what we do and why we do it. And so, you know, I don't know if this answers your question, but I feel like um, some things that help me in clarifying our strategy and what we're doing, I try to be really curious on any phone call that I have. I'm a big note taker on, on sales meetings and even client meetings. And oftentimes what I find myself writing down the most, you know, let's say on a, a sales call, you know, it's always a gold mine when someone says like, oh, I, I actually checked out your website. What I understand that you do is, and as soon as they say that, I'm just furiously typing because I want to know the words, the phrases, the analogies, because oftentimes there are things that don't occur to me. But then I realize like, oh, that's actually a better way to explain it to this type of customer. Or when our clients tell us like, oh man, what I really appreciate about what you're doing for us is that's a gold mine too, because I'm realizing, okay, this is the pain point. This is the way of positioning. And so, you know, I don't, again, I don't know if this speaks to the, your question, but when I think about strategy, sometimes it's like, you know, I, I picture in chemistry when you'd have, you know, some sort of material and you're boiling it and you're distilling it down to just this powder. Sometimes I feel like that's my biggest struggle from a strategy standpoint is there's so much we're doing. There's so much we could do, but how do I concentrate this down to the essential goodness of what we need to do to succeed? And, and one last thing that I'll share on that is, um, a friend of mine runs a company called Verblio and they've been really successful. They, they write blog posts for companies essentially. And this is a company with hundreds of employees and my mind starts spinning on all the things they could do. But every time I talk to him, it's a reminder to me, like he's really deliberate about staying in their swim lane. And it seems like as he's grown as a CEO, he's really had to cultivate a muscle of saying no to things that they could get a silver medal in and I salivate over. But why he's been so successful in my view is he really focuses on where they need to win the gold and that's all that matters and shutting out anything else that could be a distraction. I think that's gold right there because you've got leaders who see all the shiny objects that are out there. And it's so easy to go chase all these other potential wonderful opportunities but I've seen that the true growth and the true successes are those that are just laser focused on that one or two offerings that they have. And they just stay, stay true to it. And a lot of leadership is just saying no. Yeah. And, um, 
it's super hard to be able to just give things up and, um, and to hand things off and, and just trust that, you know, you did the best that you could. So, um, I think that was extremely helpful. So thank you for um, being able to share that you, um, you shared a story not too long ago about, um, needing to listen to the clients and listen to the struggles. And, um, you talked about how you probably missed an opportunity by a year. If you'd only listened to Mm -hmm. some clients, um, do you mind kind of talking about that story a little bit? I thought it was wonderful because the whole reason that we're here is, is to help clients. And, and I think you had a lot of gold within that, if you don't mind sharing that story again. Yeah, I'll share a story and then I'll kind of share a counter story because, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm finding in, in life as in business is that the, the, the hard answer on one extreme is rarely the truth. It's kind of finding two extremes and being able to, to navigate this middle path between them. So I'll share the first extreme, which was my company story box. Um, we raised $3 million in capital, as you had, as you had said. And at the time we were actually known as video genie. And as the name implies, we were 100% focused on video. So I had a lot of smart investors chirping my ears, sending me articles about the the future of video. And this was, you know, 2011. Video was going to be the next big thing. And so here I am on every podium that would have me championing video. And I noticed as I would sit in on client calls and sales calls, we would repeatedly get customers asking us about photos. What do we do with photos? What's, you know, what's Instagram? What should we be doing with that? And I was so drunk on the Kool-Aid of video, or as I would put it, I was so in love with my product. I wasn't in love with my customer. I wasn't being empathetic. I wasn't being, being curious and open when I was hearing that. I was making them wrong. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I was telling them all the reasons why photo doesn't matter and why video was superior. And another company that had started way after us that was more curious and more open came along. They were photo centric, they were Instagram centric, and they sold for $130 million, which was not my outcome. We, We missed that pivot by a year. And oftentimes in these cases, if you're second or third place, it's, you know, 80% goes to the industry leader. So it was a very painful lesson. And what I took away from that was how can I be as curious and open as possible, not just in business, but in in my marriage and life and conversations. Now, I want to just kind of briefly counterweight that by saying I, I try to equally hold that with a phrase that's attributed to Henry Ford, which is if I listen to my customers, I would have built a faster horse. And obviously the, the automobile is what, what won there. It wasn't a faster horse. And so I, I just want to share that because I don't want to say to your listeners, entrepreneurship is as easy as just listening to customers and doing what they say. If only it were that easy. I think you have to have empathy, curiosity, and openness And you have to have wisdom. You have to have an inner perspective. You have to follow your gut. And so I view it as dancing this fine line, this balancing act between being curious, open, honest, accepting of feedback from clients, but also having a hypothesis that I'm working with, that I'm constantly testing and knowing that in many ways, I'm the the trusted authority. I need to come up with a solution, but it needs to be heavily weighted by the market, by my experience and by our community and customers. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And I cannot imagine the um, emotions that go with that, that roller coaster of a story. Um, But um, you've, you've learned a lot. So I, you know, it's easy for me to say, you know, if you're learning that it's not always a a failure, but um, it still makes it hard. So, but Thank you for sharing that. I think it's, it's, it's a great story. Thank you. Tell me, um, you know, with, with messaging and and communication, you have talked about in the past about how important it is for the CEO to be able to tell the story and for, um, you actually require a couple of hours of a CEO's time each month, um, with your business today. Can you talk about why that's important and why you really can't outsource that and 
how does that impact the results um, that you're seeing with your clients? So, so the, the standard way that we would present Captivate to most enterprise companies is give us two hours a week and we'll give you a, a month of everything you need to do for marketing. But that two hours a week needs to come from the CEO or the founder. And the reason why that's so important is first of all, the relationship. So we are using usually podcasts as our content marketing engine. And we are able to get the CEO to be interviewing the best thought leaders, the biggest influencers in their space. And for listeners who haven't done a podcast or been on a podcast, I've known Catherine for all of 30 minutes, but having 30 minutes with her in this setting where I'm being vulnerable, she's sharing, she's being vulnerable, it creates a connection. Like six months from now, if Catherine reaches out to me, I'm going to remember her. I'm going to want to help her. I'm going to want whatever she's needing. She's in my tribe right now. So I want that for our CEOs. I want them to be establishing these quality relationships with the best and brightest minds in their industry. So that's one reason is the relationship. But the second reason is authority. Because when I take one of these CEOs and I have them interviewing a best-selling author or you know, a leading investor in a space, I want to create as much content that is talking head format where I've got the CEO who no one knows and I've got this thought leader who everyone knows. And just like all of us who see it on CNN or Fox News or wherever it is, I just equate, I equate proximity with, with authority. And so I think, oh, okay, I don't know much about this CEO, but I know this other person there. If this person's meeting with them, they've got to be important. They've got to have some cliche. You're kind of riding their, their coattails. And so I want to build influence by drafting off the influence of others. So those two reasons are why I say, look, I know CEOs are busy. I know you've got a lot of, a lot of things on your plate, but because of the relationship, because of the authority, it needs to come from you. I love it. So I have to ask, I love, you know, I've spent too many years in banking and, and numbers and everything else. How do you, how do you measure success yeah. today? Um, I'm just curious, is it different for each type of client or is it, you know, pretty consistent overall? How do you measure success? So just like the way that we work with clients is unique, we I noticed that there are trends that um, there are a couple different buckets of what people value. One bucket is using the podcast and what we do strictly for business development. So they're interviewing the people they want to work with. So for them, podcast listens, you know, website views, it doesn't really matter as much as I'm talking and building relationships and do these people become my customers? That's a great, great metric. Other clients, they focus on the podcast. They want to see how many listens. They want to grow that. Great. Different strategy to grow that, but we can focus on that. Other clients say, I don't even care about the podcast. I know that if this takes off on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok, that's what really matters. So we're measuring marketing qualified leads from these other channels. So those are kind of the three most common ones we see. We have other ones. We have clients that are fundraising and all they want to do is make their CEO seem like a rock star so they can raise money. That's a great metric as well. But we can measure and track any of these. But what's important to know is that the strategy strategy to achieve any of those four is very different, right? If I'm trying to get podcast listens versus marketing qualified leads, like different approaches, we just need to be aligned and honest on what's important and we'll tailor our approach to that. I love a tailored approach. Yep. It's, it's a win-win. Yep. Tell me, um, as we're starting to wrap up, I would love to hear, you know, you've had so many things going on. You mentioned your marriage, you mentioned you have a family. Yep. Um, I'm sure you have hobbies and things like that, but what are ways that you recharge? Because I think that's an important part of the culture that, that we're building today 
is realizing that we do need to step away and we do need to find time for ourselves to be able to recharge. Do you do anything in particular that kind of helps you with that? And what are your thoughts around it? A hundred percent. And um, I'll, I'll share with listeners that when I met my wife, now wife, um, I was at a low point with Storybox where I was overweight, financially bankrupt, you know, spiritually bankrupt, like every area depleted. And one of my goals, you know, over that, that led me to therapy, meditation, a whole, whole spiritual path. But um, one of my commitments in starting Captivate was it's not a sprint. I need for the company to succeed. I need to be in my peak performance zone. And so for me right now, the two biggest ways that I do that, um, one is exercise and other is connection. Um, Exercise, I love to run and that time for me is sacred. Mm -hmm. Having time on my own as an introvert to recharge, move my body, be outside, see other people, get some sunshine. That's one thing that's really big for me right now. And then on the connection piece, um, I'm a big fan of men's groups. Um, I lead in men's groups. I participated in a men's group. I have one of those every week and having that 90 minutes to connect uh, vulnerably, authentically, to share what's going on in my life, to be seen, to be heard is very valuable. I have a friend that I connect with every single week. We talk for an hour. He vents for 30 minutes. I vents for 30 minutes. We practice reflective conversation, which is really powerful. So those are just two examples, but it's kind of getting that connection for me, realizing that I really need to be, um, I don't have to do it everywhere, but I need to have a couple places where I can just be open and honest about my struggles and triumphs and be challenged and held accountable. So those are, those are two that work for me. I love that too. The, um, to be able to have different types of communities that can support you throughout this whole journey that you're going through, I think is important. And I was learning from another podcast that, you know, in today's society that we expect our spouse to be this one person who can do all of these things. And a hundred years ago, and even before that, we had communities that we could lean on and our spouse wasn't responsible for having to be our motivator and our, our partner in life and all these other things. And it kind of made me realize, you know, there's some insights to there. And it sounds like, you know, you're living that and you, you went down that path and that journey to, to find that. So congratulations for finding it and for sticking to it. And, um, I think there's a lot to be said because you can come back as a better person every day by, by just being able to t- take that time. And I'm so glad, I'm so glad you said that. Cause like, I, I hope for myself and for our listeners, we can lower our expectation for any single facet of our life. You know, my, my wife right now, let me, let me give her a little bit of grace and room that she doesn't have to fulfill all of my needs. It's the same for running. It's like, if I, you know, I enjoy running for the exercise it gives me, if I was expecting that to be my full-time job and pay my bills, I'm putting too much burden on running. Same for my job. Like, it's just kind of like, I feel like any one of these things could sustain a little bit of weight, but not all of our full weight. And so it's important to spread out our needs across different sources. That's wonderful. Tell me, um, you know, as we wrap up today, what are maybe one or two things as far as, as advice that maybe you've learned that maybe we haven't covered yet? Um, one piece of advice, uh, one of my advisors, Harpy Madan, brilliant man. Uh, he works at innovation endeavors as an investor. He told me early on in my fundraising, uh, for story box, don't nickel and dime fundraising. Don't worry about equity that much. If it succeeds, everyone's going to be happy. If it fails, 2% of a difference in your company ownership won't make a difference. And I think about that a lot, which is like, let me focus on making this company a success. Let me, let me maximize the probability of that. If I have to give away pieces to different employees or investors, it's worth it. It's, 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 you know, it's a worth it trade. Um, and then a second one, just to kind of echo what you had said is, you know, take care of yourself. I think there's a lot of toxic advice out there that is of the genre of work 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's too much research about the importance of sleep, the importance of balance, creative outlets, 
you know, think of the last great idea you had. I, I highly doubt it was in a cubicle or a work environment. It was very likely interacting with people, grabbing a beer, going for a run. So don't, don't listen to the mainstream advice that you have to sacrifice yourself at the altar of success. Know that if you're nourishing yourself and pushing yourself to live outside of your comfort zone, yes, you, you may be running at a high pace, but I, I bet you're going to need to take care of yourself in terms of what you eat and what you put into your mind and into your spirit. And, and that's just as valuable as the work you're doing. Well said, Justin. Tell me a little bit of where we can find more information about you. Easiest way to get a hold of me is at captivate.ai. If you request a demo, that will in some way get to me. Um, I'm also easy to find on LinkedIn, Justin Nasiri, but um, there's not a lot of Nasiris out there. So Nasiri and captivate.ai will get you to me on LinkedIn or to our website. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your stories today, Justin. I so appreciate it. And uh, thank you to our listeners for tuning in and learning a little bit more about business vitality and Justin and Captivate. And uh, we're going to wrap this one up. So this has been the Business Vitality Podcast with your host, Catherine Canty. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the episode. If you like it, please subscribe, share this episode or this show with other people around you. The greatest form of a compliment is a referral. I really appreciate them. And if you think that you want to learn more about some of the work we're doing, I encourage you to reach out to katherinecanty.com. You can schedule a call or just continue to read articles and information that we post out there. Thank you so much for being here.